Sorry, I had a little problem with my dog. That's okay. So we're live streaming now, guys. All right, thank you. Mark, why don't you go ahead? I'm, I don't have a screen. What? There you go. Okay. Are you ready, Mark? I am. Thank you, okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, and good morning uh, to you all. Good morning, Peggy. I'm sorry you had to do that struggle. You're, you're great under fire. And hello, um, Ledge Console. I think Bryn here was on. Maybe she dropped off. Uh, oh, there you are. Um, so thank you for, uh, for having me. Um, I am uh, Mark Hughes. I'm a resident of Burlington and I've resided in Vermont for about the past 11 years. I'm a retired army officer. I'm also a lifetime member of the Veterans of Foreign, Foreign War and a member of the, uh, the Will Miller chapter of Veterans uh, for Peace. Um, I'm the executive uh, director of Justice for All and I'm also the current uh, coordinator for the uh, Racial Justice Alliance. I'm a commissioner of the Burlington Police Department and additionally, uh, I'm, I'm the architect of Act 54, uh, 2017, the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. It's all, also uh, Act 9, uh, 2018 special, uh, Executive Director of Racial uh, Equity and Panel. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I think it's a result of uh, uh, Justice for All and the Racial uh, Justice Alliance and the commitment of countless uh, Vermonters and the tireless hours of legislators. Uh, legislators that these uh, that these particular laws exist. So uh, thank you so much for having me today. I came uh, just to share a little bit about it, and I understand we'll be uh, following up in Gov Ops at the end of the week on impacts of uh, people of color across uh, the state of COVID uh, COVID virus COVID nineteen rather. Um, I just want to qualify, do not speak for every, every black and brown person across the state, obviously. Uh, we do have a local constituency. We have uh, been reaching out uh, fairly effectively to that local constitu constituency. Uh, our um, our um, uh, steering committee is about maybe 15 or 20 black and brown folks right here in the, uh, in the Burlington area. So uh, a lot of stuff is coming from, from them and also uh, from concentric circles. Uh, from there. What I'll do in the testimony briefly today, it's looking like I started around a minute or so ago. Uh, try to just go for uh, 10 minutes. Uh, I'll probably just go like full out just for uh, a bit and then uh, and pull back because there's a lot uh, to say. Uh, obviously, uh, black and brown people are, um, are being impacted adversely uh, exponentially in times like this. Uh, I want to um, go over a, a few issues in particular that we have identified and that we are working on some of them, all of them you are familiar with. Uh, I will um, hopefully, uh, I can probably even share uh, with you uh, some, um, some visual aids along the way here in this brief conversation. And, and then I want to leave about four or five minutes on the end so we can answer some uh, questions. Uh, during the course of this conversation, um, I will uh, try to drill down into one or two of these. Yeah. Uh, We've got about 12 minutes, Mark. So I beg your pardon? We have 12 minutes. Okay. So uh, just so you know, the, um, you know, the work of, the Ju of Justice for All, we've always been involved and we continue to be involved with the, the dismantling of root and the root causes of systemic uh, racism. Um, also the elimination of poverty and also in addressing the impact of you know, black and brown and poor people on a daily basis. Uh, systemic racism uh, and poverty, uh, they're at the heart of and the source of COVID-19. And unfortunately, uh, these vulnerable demographics are among the chief benefactors of, of the most severe impact of this uh, particular pandemic. Uh, today, uh, all of the disparities associated with this uh, systemic racism and poverty are being simultaneously exacerbated. Uh, so that's what I came to, to tell you about just a little bit about, I have um, just some couple of numbers I'd like to share with you if that's okay. Um, if you take a look at your screen, you'll see um, what we have here is, is there are, you know, some pretty compelling numbers just in terms of poverty across uh, the uh, United States. And proportionately, I think that's where that conversation starts, but the implications on, on uh, just, you know, what it is that we're experiencing here uh, cannot be overstated. You know, there have already been 
Uh, you know, we already struggle, you know, pre-COVID-19 with disparities in employment. At no time in history has the unemployment rate for Black people been uh, less than double that of white people. Uh, so uh, this, this is a very difficult time, obviously, in housing and education. And yes, you can see and appreciate the rest. Uh, the, you know, even the, um, you know, the folks over, uh, you know, at the Census Bureau, as well as, you know, and these are slides that, that came from our folks at, you um, the uh, um, Paul Clilly on those guys over there. What's the name of that organization? Um, Vermont. Uh, oh God, uh, I get stuck. I'll come back to it. Uh, Stephanie, you, uh, Steph, you, and Paul over there. You know what I'm talking about. So just you know, just laying out, if you will, the case of uh, where you know people of color in Vermont are likely uh, to experience poverty, and, and comparing that across uh, different areas. And you can see there was actually an increase from uh, 17. In 18, you know, it, it goes without saying, and, and maybe it doesn't, but just to know that the average uh, median wealth, the median uh, wealth rather, of, uh, of 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 black folks across the United States uh, is one thirteenth that of white folks, because that's just an empirical fact. It's that's just, those are just the data, and I'll just uh, you know conclude you know this part of this um, discussion with just some of the things that you know I mentioned at Act 54 to top of this conversation and. And there was a part, you know, called the Attorney General's and Human Rights Commission's Task Force that went in and took a look at housing and education, employment, health services access, and, and economic development. And these are some of the comments that were made. And for the benefit of some of you who are on the phone, I'll just read a couple of them. Uh, one says, the need for white people to understand implicit unconscious bias, white privilege, white fragility, and how these contribute to the maintenance of an all-white system uh, we currently have. <clears throat> Again, these are quotes that came out of the final report from the Attorney General and the Human Rights Commission Executive Director at time. The, the other one that I'll leave with you is, is we must undertake a, a system-wide analysis of ways in which state government actively and passively contributes to these disparities, collect data and determine our baseline and set goals for reducing these disparities across all agencies. So yes, uh, what we're dealing with here um, is, um, is exacerbated again uh, you know, as, as I said, by uh, the challenges, I, I see um, uh, David Schur has joined us. Uh, thank you, David, for joining. And also thank you for your service on the racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system advisory panel, uh, another apparatus that's been uh, put in place to address uh, what we've already identified uh, as um, systems of oppression. Uh, some of the things that we're working with right now, uh, Justice for All, is we're taking a close look at um, education technology disparities right now. Obviously with all of our children in school across the state, well, many of your children, I don't have any children in school across the state, but all of, with all of our children in school across the state, uh, obviously the, um, their ability to access the internet, their ability to have those technology platforms to do so and the internet, uh, obviously increasingly important, again, exacerbated, the disparities exacerbated uh, by the COVID-19 uh, issue uh, here. Um, uh, some of you may have seen a uh, correspondence from us voting in open meeting uh, equity. Uh, of course, you know, when you when you take uh, the process, when you propose a process and modify it uh, by ballots, uh, say, for example, um, being um, um, no longer no longer requiring rather signatures on ballots and or uh, mailing of ballots and uh, changing processes and rules surrounding open meetings. It's incredibly important that these communities, communities of color are aware uh, of this and, and that they're notified in a in an equitable manner. Uh, and, um, you know, and I'll go on and talk a little bit uh, more about um, travel restrictions. You know, I think it's pretty much a no brainer uh, that, you know, with the current uh, uh, disparities in our uh, racial, in, in our uh, criminal justice system, and with what we know to be empirical data uh, supporting the fact that there are racial disparities in that system, particularly on the front line with traffic stops and so forth, and also, just historical historical exceptionism that we have here in the state uh, as saying no, not us. Uh, there is certainly a risk, uh, you know, that we that we have right now um, with um, with the current situation unfolding, the governor's um, announcements of the uh, restrictions, and how we balance that is incredibly important. Uh, not just from what we already know and see in those things that we're balancing currently, but also though the implications of the existing systems of oppression that were already in place and the impact of people who are black and brown who are uh, faced with confrontations with law enforcement officers um, and usually with poor results. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, the um, evic eviction moratorium in, in just a, a couple minutes. And I'll also um, I'll talk a little bit about decarceration. In fact, um, I want to talk uh, go here just as a as a as a uh, dig digression, if you will, to um, to just briefly spend a few minutes uh, talking about the um, the whole um, decarceration. So we're kind of concerned about the decarceration piece, uh, mostly uh, for two two major reasons. One is transparency, and the other one has to do with uh, collaboration. Um, we know and understand and respect the uh, gravity of the situation uh, with the emergency, but uh, at the same time, there are apparatuses in place to facilitate those who've already been appointed by the committee of committees, by the uh, Speaker of the House, uh, by the governor himself, uh, by the HRC and so forth within that, uh, again, David, the, uh, the RDAP. And you know, we, 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 strongly, we strongly advise uh, those who are currently doing this kind of work uh, respectfully judge and, and also um, others like say, for example, Matt uh, Valerio and others, uh, thank you for joining Matt, uh, that we, 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 we think it's really important right now that you're engaging that apparatus that's already been put in place. And uh, you know, those five voices are already at the table. Uh, this conversation should not be required uh, because those five voices are already at the table. So respectfully, I'm just strongly urging you uh, to engage that apparatus for, if for no other reason than to do so to be able to have these collaborative conversations surrounding changing the justice system with every member that represents the justice system, all eight members that sit at that table, but moreover, providing the transparency for people of color in our communities, those five people that were appointed uh, by, um, by the uh, Act 54 uh, 2017. That being said, uh, I would just quickly turn to uh, once again, this, um, what is currently on the table uh, in terms of uh, the, um, what is uh, pending right now. And I'll just, I, I, what I'm looking for is, is the, um, the, um, the rule, I think I'll just speak to it instead of pulling it up because I'm, I'm, I'm believing that if I waste too much, oh, I think I know where it is, here it is. So there is- Mark, a, we got about three minutes left, so. Uh, I was hoping you'd get to the bills that are in front of us. Okay, well, time goes fast when you're having fun, I guess. So how about if I just uh, summarize this uh, with this, um, you know, our, our take on the um, what's being proposed uh, by, you know, with this bill. Um, what, I, what, what I would say is, is that, you know, although we're in agreement uh, with, uh, with, with much of what uh, is being put forward, uh, the recommendations on the changes of Title, title 13 and also in, in uh, Rule 35, um, we, we still strongly believe that there, there, there could be a, a, a more of a collaborative effort. Uh, and also, to, uh, the, we also feel that there should be more um, transparency in, in this process. Um, also, we believe that the, um, the changes in the changes here in this uh, in this uh, um, statute, as well as uh, proposal and the rules, um, I, we we really believe that they do indeed speak to the heart of uh, the ability to go back and revisit a sentence, which is really extremely important when we know that there are racial disparities <coughs> in the justice system, and that it could have been a harsh sentence, and it could have we could have folks who are incarcerated who could be their cases could be re revisited. So we certainly believe that not only are these uh, changes necessary uh, immediately, but these changes are, they, the absence of these changes serve as part of the reason why we have uh, the current situation that we have in the criminal justice system. We currently, we certainly believe that these changes should uh, probably be uh, permanent. Um, regarding, and, the, and I'll conclude with uh, just the, uh, the whole idea of, and I'll just, uh, in for, for you know in the absence of time to be able to go back and talk and speak really uh, to uh, eviction moratorium we'll just come back to that another time but we certainly have a position on that that we wish we had time to talk about um, but I think that uh, you know what's really important the only other piece here that's important that I really want to try to get across here is, is this whole landlord tenant business 
and this idea of the moratorium. Uh, we understand, you know, on all fronts, uh, the legislative, the executive, as well as the judiciary approaches to this, but uh, those approaches in combination still leave the latitude for a discretionary decision for, uh, to be made in terms of eviction. And we believe that should be off the table. And whether that involves the removal of, of mm -hmm. that as an option with the emergency judiciary procedures or whether it be a legislative action, we'd like to get some rest at night, uh, not worrying about whether uh, a, a sheriff knocks on our door. And yes, sheriffs are still knocking on doors because one knocked on my door just a few days ago. So um, I'd like to um, you know, conclude the whole um, eviction and moratorium um, conversation uh, simply by uh, taking it to uh, one other, what we believe to be as an oversight is, is this is Title 12 of uh, 4773. Uh, what concerns us is that a defendant in the last Mark, sentence- we, We've already gone 15, so you want to get another two in, that, please wrap up. Yes, sir. What concerns us here is, is that a defendant may not defeat an ejectment action uh, by payment of all rent in arrears, uh, interest, or court costs more than one time in 12 months uh, what this essentially is saying, and I speak from experience because I've experienced this myself, and I certainly wouldn't want to experience this at this time. We believe that is probably just an oversight, but I think that addressing language like this is also incredibly important at a time like this, uh, because there's no way in, in the world that we should be in a time where if you can't, if you go into an eviction, your second eviction within 12 months, that there's no way that you can defeat it. So in conclusion, I would you know, want to thank the, um, the um, the committee uh, for the hard work I've been monitoring, um, much of the work uh, that you were doing on your off time. Uh, I want to thank um, the judiciary uh, as well as those uh, over in the, the, the state's attorney's offices and the attorney general's offices for the hard work uh, that you have been put uh, that you put in. And I don't think anybody on the call can be more acknowledged uh, than our ledge counsel uh, as well as um, folks like Peggy. Uh, so we appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you some of the pain. Uh, that we're feeling in, but we're doing the work. Uh, we appreciate the work you're doing. Uh, transparency is incredibly important. Uh, that ability to have that collaboration uh, ongoing so we're not getting uh, stories from multiple sources uh, is, is another uh, thing that we believe is missing. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, uh, to appear before your committee. And I thank you uh, committee members for the work you're doing. Thank you, Mark. Um, I wanted to make clear that Whatever we do here right now, under the rules set for the committees, is that we uh, can only do things that would expire at the end of the um, emergency. So that's any changes we make are temporary. Pardon me? I said that's unfortunate considering that some of the things that we're talking about are the edifice of the challenges that we're dealing with. Uh, I understand that, but we're constrained by rules too. And uh, just like everybody. And I, I think that at some point, this discussion about sentence reconsideration, and evictions are more into the, um, uh, the Economic Development Committee, but um, since Judge brought them up, but whatever we do here would be time sensitive to this emergency. And in terms of transparency, believe me, we're doing the best we can to try to be as transparent as possible in what we're doing, but these are certainly unprecedented times. So, Mr. Um, Chairman, with due respect, uh, the, the uh, transparency, just for clarification for everybody on the call, uh, the transparency uh, piece that I'm talking about uh, is, is the ability for people of color to be able to see into the criminal justice system and how these decisions are being made because these are not just numbers, these are people's lives. Thank you. Um, my understanding is that the corrections department has already dropped down to 1,477 people incarcerated in Vermont, and that's down from, I think, 1,620 odd individuals um, before the, um, in the beginning of March. So they're making efforts to reduce the population. Um, We'd just like to see the demographics of those reductions. Well... We'd like to be involved in the process of understanding how those decisions are being made. That's the transparency that I'm talking about. You can reduce the numbers all day long if you know you're dealing with a system that has disparities. Then, of course, you want to you want to manage that process in the same manner. Well, um, thank you. 
appreciate that, Mark. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I don't have an agenda in front of me because I'm working remotely and I'm working with two different computers and uh, I'm getting, getting frustrated here today. So, the the Arctic, the real issue right now, and, and Bryn or Eric, if you, I guess it's Bryn uh, who's been drafting this. Yep, I have it. Um, we've I got think draft is posted to the committee web page if you want to talk about that next. Okay, I, I need to go to the committee web page. All right. Which that. one are you going to address, Bryn? Your draft 1.2? It's my draft point one point two. It should be under today's date, under my yep. name. Got it. Okay. Hold on just a second while I try to get there myself. Yep. I'll wait for a minute so everybody can get it up on their screens. Okay. Yep. Um, hold on. I'm I'm there. And what do I want? Documents and handouts today. March 31st. That's right. Okay. And it's 114 draft 1. <laughs> 1.2, right? That's right. All right. We got it. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Great. Rent into court expedited hearing. That's right. Presence. Yep. That's section one. So I'll just start by saying that this is um, a, a strike all amendment to S114, which is that expungement of misdemeanor marijuana possession conviction. <clears throat> Yep. Um, all of those sections of the bill are gone and it just so this is really just a vehicle for um, the legislative changes that the judiciary proposed in their memo um, from about a week ago. So I'll go through the all of all of these proposals are um, you've talked about already with Judge Grierson. Um, they come directly from the judiciary and they're based on the um, administrative order 49 that uh, suspends all non-emergent hearings. So there is one additional section that was not in that proposal and that's the last section of the bill. So, um, and that's the proposal to suspend statute of limitations for civil proceedings. So I'll just go through the bill section by section. I'll try and do it pretty quickly. I know we've not got a whole okay. lot of time. I think you've talked yeah. about these proposals already. Hopefully it'll all be pretty clear. So section one is that change um, to rent escrow hearings. This is the change that gives judges uh, the discretion um, to order payment of rent. Um, so if you recall, Judge Gershon talked about how these rent escrow hearings are not emergency hearings, so they're not being held right now. Um, so the consequence is that more rent may be due when the hearings are held again. So the only change here is to strike the word shall and replace it with may. The court may order full or partial payment into court. Um, and that just, it provides for judicial discretion. Section two is an amendment to rule 42 requiring the presence of a defendant um, at criminal court proceedings. The, it adds a new section of law on page two, subsection D that just says that for purposes of rule 43, um, the defendant shall be deemed present in court if they make an on the record waiver of their right to be physically present and instead they're contemporary they're contemporaneously present via video or audio conference transmission and it just indicates that the video conference or audio conference um, those definitions match with the definitions in rule 43.1 participation of testimony by video or audio conference okay Next two sections of the bill, sections three and four, are both dealing with the sentence modification issue. Um, so section three makes that amendment to the statute in Title 13, gives the, um, the court that imposed the sentence the authority to modify that sentence beyond that 90-day time frame that exists already in statute, as long as it has the stipulation of the parties. And the parties mean, and we've, we've specified here that the stipulation has to be between the defendant and the prosecutor's office that prosecuted the case. Can we, um, Bryn, just as a question, can we make that applicable to non big 12 offenses or non listed offenses? You, you could do that, certainly. Um, I, I'm concerned about certain criminal acts that might 
but if you had this is Jeanette, if you had um, uh, the agreement by both the prosecutor and the defendant, <coughs> I would think that the prosecutor wouldn't wouldn't well, agree. Would I? But but I would guess that every defense attorney would feel they had an obligation to file one of these for every offender that's under them uh, or that they represent. And I can just imagine uh, if, um, and I'm not going to name the names, but you can think of certain horrific crimes that have been committed in Vermont. And if those people apply for sentence, um, I, you know, I, I just think you'd have this outcry in the public. And I, so, I think though, hey Dick, if I can chip in there um, as the only defense attorney on the committee, we can't file anything without a stipulation from the prosecutor attached to it. If I'm reading this correctly and Bryn, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can't approach the court and file something unless and until you've got the prosecutor on board with it. I understand your concern. I've heard from some people as well that this might be opening up something that might cause problems. Well, that well, prosecutor is the gatekeeper. I understand that, but do you want, then make this bill separate because I suspect you're gonna run into trouble with the governor. You may even run into trouble on the, on the Senate floor and definitely run into trouble in the house. So I, I would say that if you're gonna do this, um, I, I mean, I just wouldn't, given some of the things that I've already heard about this proposal and concerns expressed, I'm concerned that we have a provision here that's not going to be like some of the others that we adopt with voice vote, and no debate. And so I, I'm trying to be mindful of how we can best present this so we can get a, get less problems with it. So I, I'm fearful that this section will drag down everything else. Nick, to be honest, unless we had adjusted, as I just suggested, with something like, you know, non Big 12 offenses. Can I chip in, Dick? Yep. So this is similar to a concern that I have, even with this revised language, but coming at it from a different uh, perspective. So um, I raised the issue last time. It says otherwise modify, um, but everybody's talking in our discussions about reducing sentences or vacating sentences. And so I'm, I'm wondering why we're holding on to such vague language as otherwise modify. It seems as though we should be more specific rather than less, unless we're okay with, um, in your case, having big 12 offenses reduced. And in my case, um, living with the possibility that those other modifications maybe things that we didn't intend. So when it comes maybe to Judge Grierson's testimony, maybe he can explain what, what other than reducing or modifying a sentence is contemplated by the language or otherwise modify. Because I would be more comfortable if it was just limited to reducing or vacating. And Alice here, I would be more comfortable if it was in another bill. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe we could hear from Judge Grierson and then Matt and then Pepper. I see Pepper. If Campbell's on, he can speak too. And David, sure, certainly. So, Judge? Sure. Uh, thank you, Senator, and thanks, the committee, for setting this up uh, via video. As, as I indicated in my earlier uh, testimony, um, we, this is obviously purely a policy decision. Uh, I would not want this provision to jeopardize this, this bill. Um, this is, um, so to the extent that this was changed, either removed or limited language to reduction of sentence. Um, I think that there are other parts of this bill, at least from, from the judiciary's perspective that are critical to our operations. And by that, I mean the, the video appearances and some of the deadlines uh, that need to be extended. This, this is purely a mechanism um, that was, uh, at least the language was, as Senator Benning indicated, subject only to agreement of the parties. Um, this is not uh, the court trying to 
uh, usurp anyone's authority. Um, but I, I'm concerned if, um, if this piece would jeopardize other parts of the bill. Um, okay. Um, Pepper, do you want to chime in? Yeah. Um, with respect to just the modification language as, as opposed to just reduce, you know, I'm working on an appeal right now where I'm trying to get a offender, an incarcerated person out, got a split sentence. And uh, he wants to change the to serve portion of his split to a probationary period. So that would not be a reduction in a sentence, but it would be a modification. So he could be moved out of an incarcerated setting. Uh, but his the total length of his sentence would remain the same. He would just tack that additional to serve portion to his probationary period. So that would be a modification, not a reduction. And I think that, you know, the state's attorney would be more than willing to stipulate to something along those lines, but not a just straight up reduction. And it would be under the idea that, you know, he's a risk to, you know, he's got a pre-existing condition that puts him at risk for COVID. So get him out of the kind of jail setting, the prison setting, but don't actually reduce the sentence. And that would be a modification that would be permitted under this language. Um, if I could... Just Dick, this is John too. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure that because we have other, I've got other uh, matters we can address. I just want to make sure we'll be able to have time to do that. If, yep. if I could just speak to Pepper's point, um, yep. Pepper, I, I take, I take your point. I think the larger problem I'm having with this piece is that it's it's situated within the COVID nineteen frame, but it's giving a huge amount of um, discretion post conviction that doesn't otherwise exist. And it's got no real guardrails on it uh, unless they're agreed upon by parties that are not us. Um, so I would, you know, if we continue to pursue this language, I would want more specification. So the, the kind of swap that you just mentioned, that makes sense to me and that could be stipulated in the, in the language. But you know, uh, uh, just a, on its face, the language now would allow for things that uh, I might not agree with, or uh, the, the chair voiced some concerns that it might be used for someone who had committed an egregious offense in ways that this committee doesn't go along with. So I, I guess I'm in a roundabout way echoing Alice's comment, um, this seems more controversial, more thorny, the, the more we talk about it. May, may I respond, Chair? Yep, please. I just, uh, our testimony today, when we were asked to testify, is exactly along the lines of what you just described, that there are a number of issues that this, these two paragraphs in two different sections of the law or the rules don't address. And uh, John will go through those later. Okay, um, so I, I'm hearing concern. Um, so um, I'm fishing around here to where we are. So um, it may be that we decide to put um, this section in another bill and deal with it separately. Uh, can you keep going through it, Bryn, through the draft? Sure thing. <clears throat> so I'm going to skip section four since that's the other, that's just the same change made to the rule and move to section five. So I'm on page four now. Yep. <clears throat> this is the heading that's titled Administrative Order Number 49, Judicial Emergency Response. Yep. Um, so this provides that um, during the period of time that Administrative Order Number 49 is in effect. Um, the statutory timeframes for certain hearings um, or proceedings are suspended. So if you look down um, at the bottom of the page here, um, we've got A, B, and C. So the hearing on application for involuntary treatment, the hearing on application for involuntary medication, and then the preliminary and merits hearings on civil suspension of driver's license. Those um, statutory timeframes would be suspended just for the period of time that um, that AO 49 is in effect. If you turn to page five. Yeah. 
Sorry. Did I hear it? Did I hear I, it? I have a now? question, but I'll wait. Yeah, I'll well, wait. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeanette. Well, I just wondered what what does it mean to um, suspend the uh, time frame for involuntary treatment and medication? I don't. What would be the effect of that? The practical effect. So the practical effect is that currently, under current law, there's um, a, a time frame that's required to hold those hearings, and I can't remember what that is at the moment. Um, but that that time frame would not apply just for the duration. So it's a, I think for involuntary treatment, it's a 10 day. It's 10 days um, mm -hmm. after the application, and seven days for involuntary medication. So those um, required time frames would be waived during the period that AO49 is in effect. And has the Department of Mental Health weighed in on that one? I don't think so. I'm just curious because um, that is that is such a touchy subject already um, about when when those are held and um, I'm I would I would really want to hear from Jack McCulloch on that and the Department of Mental Health. So I'll, I'll move on to the, um, yep. if it's all right, Senator mm -hmm. Sears. I think you're on mute, Senator. Senator Sears, I think you were on mute there. So shall I keep going? No, oh, I'm unmuted now. No. Okay. I'm sorry, Bryn. I was saying, hopefully, um, Jack McCullough and Sarah Squirrel can get a copy of this. We're going to be briefly talking with Sarah tomorrow anyway, and if they have a problem with this, let us know. I'll make sure they have a copy. Thank you. Um, so go right ahead. Okay, so I'm at the top of page five now. We're in the same mm -hmm. section um, of law here. Uh, it provides that yep. during the time that AO49 is in effect and for 160 days following um, the date that it's terminated, all the statutory time frames that exist in the um, sealing and expungement chapter would be suspended. Okay. And then finally, um, sub subdivision three here on page five, this says that for the duration of AO 49, um, courts can't suspend uh, driver's licenses until and unless the court holds a hearing on that civil suspension on the merits. Okay. Any comments on any of these sections that Bryn just went over. Everybody good with them? Okay. Yeah, except for that mental health part. Except for the mental health part. Um, yep. So later on this morning, we have on the agenda to talk about the statute of limitations, but if you want to cover it now, um, and it, that's section six, right? Yep, that's the last section. Did you want to cover that now? Um, we're going to hear testimony on it later from Terry Corsones and um, I can't think of the man's name, but an attorney from Burlington. Sure. If you'd like me to, uh, I'd be glad to talk about that one now. So yeah, it's, why don't we? Okay. It's pretty straightforward language that tolls the statute of limitations for all um, civil actions. During the period of time that the governor has declared a state of emergency arising from the spread of COVID-19, and 60 days following um, the termination of the state emergency. So it also provides lines 16 through 19, any deadlines that are imposed by court order for pending civil cases um, would remain in effect, but could be extended by the court for good cause shown. And that good cause shown could include any cause that's related to the COVID-19 public health emergency. Okay. What does told so mean? So t told means that you would add that amount of time That's to the statute. Of but I would say that it's also just it's not necessary the way that this. So for example, um, if the statute of limitations would otherwise run out on April 1st, uh, the duration of the state of emergency would be added. Um, that period of time would be added from April 1st. Thank you. And then um, lastly, it would take effect on passage and then the title of the bill is just renamed 
um, to an act relating to the emergency judicial response to the COVID-19 public health emergency. And that's it. Dick, can I go back and ask yep. a question? Yep. Bryn, um, back in section one, we are changing the mandatory shall to may, but it's not connected in any way, shape or form to the current declaration of emergency. And That's right. And I was not aware of the rule. Um, so now that I know that, that, that the Senate is only um, doing working on legislation that's tied to the emergency, I would think about either adding language that ties it specifically to the state of emergency, or we could also put in a repeal date. Yeah, I, I don't know about the rest of the committee, but I'm a little nervous about um, eliminating the shall provision to extend beyond the current emergency situation, because that opens up another can of worms that I don't think the rental community has had an opportunity to weigh in on at all. Agree, agree with you. Yes. I do think that, um, the, that Senator Sears, you mentioned this, that the um, Economic Development Committee is working on some landlord tenant issues out, yeah. outside of them. Um, I'm not sure that I'm not sure the extent of the of the things that they're working on, but I can find out well, and let the committee. Well, all I can tell you is every time we have a meeting, I'm um, I'm told that they're dealing with it, and that's from uh, Senator Clarkson. But I don't think they're doing any legislation. They just keep. Um, but I don't know. Senator, if I could jump in, this yep. is Jeff Pearson. Um, I'm supposed to be in uh, Senator Clarkson's. Uh, committee meeting uh, now on, uh, th there is a bill, I don't know if it originated, I don't think it originated with their um, committee, but they are taking up a bill this morning, as I understand it, that would deal with landlord tenant issues and, and foreclosures. Okay. All right, well, Here's my suggestion, Bryn, um, and we have S-217, which is the bill that deals with the uh, human trafficking um, that we're not gonna take up because the House bill has passed a similar bill. And we could uh, do a strike all of S-217 with the sections that have to do with the um, uh, sentence modification or sentence restructuring or reduction in sentence. So, okay, I'll put that together. Okay, so we take that out of this bill. And um, are there any other comments on this particular bill? And then we'll do a separate bill on the, um, which would be S217. Uh, Senator, again, this is Judge Grierson. I did send some language to Bryn, uh, I think it was early this morning, so she may not have seen it, relating to Section 6, the statute of limitations. That's yep. the only language that wasn't part of my original proposal. Um, right. And what I had suggested to Bryn and would ask the committee to consider, uh, we want to make sure that the tolling of the statute uh, only applies to cases that the statute hasn't already expired. So on line, beginning on line, let me find it. At the end of line 15, we would, we don't think that the line 16 through 19 are necessary. Um, we, we do that anyway in individual cases, uh, the attorneys can file motions and we can still address them if they're of an emergency nature. So I don't think the language 16 through 19 is necessary. Um, I conveyed that to David uh, Mickenberg also this morning. Okay. But what we would add um, is a sentence in place that says, this only applies to deadlines that would otherwise expire during the state of emergency. This only applies to deadlines that would otherwise expire during the state of emergency. I'd ask the committee to consider adding that language and striking everything after that. Okay. 
Okay. And unless uh, committee members or anyone has any other questions for me, I'm supposed to be there. Okay. On the committee hearing. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Actually, if I can yeah. weigh in there, Dick, um, Judge, the the classic example shows up if the governor removes the declaration of emergency, but four months down the road reimposes one because there's been a flare back. <laughs> Would your, um, you still would like to have that opportunity in the event of the second declaration? Am I safe in assuming that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Ren, I don't know how you're going to word that, but that's one of the things we've been struggling with on rules, trying to make sure we give the opportunity for all of this to come back into play immediately upon a further declaration. Um, but it's just something to be cognizant of moving forward that this is one of the potential problems that we may face with this particular pandemic, um, that we all of a sudden may have to redo everything we're doing right now for the immediate emergency and to somehow craft language that takes care of another triggering of that declaration. Just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, committee members. Thank you. Okay. And Bryn, if you need me, just call me. So, could I weigh in briefly? Stat Pardon me? Could I weigh in briefly? Yes, sure, please. All right. Um, I'm hearing the discussion here and uh, regarding the Rule 35 and 13 VSA 7042 amendment. And uh, um, I would just soon uh, have you strike it from this bill and leave everything alone. Um, currently, uh, we, uh, there are some prosecutors who believe there's current authority, um, to do what we need to do to get these people out under the current circumstances based on, uh, the existing rule, the existing statute and, uh, constitutional grounds and various writs that we have. And I'd rather have you just leave it alone than diddle around with it and potentially limit uh, the options that are available. Okay. Um, thank you, Matt. I, I um, all right. Uh, so anybody else would like to speak on that? Uh, Dale Crook was um, on the This is John Campbell. Yep. It, Dick, you want me to just, uh, I, I would, Echo what Matt said. I think it, you know, again, you know, there are you know, glaring issues that that we were that I would raise on this, and that our prosecutors have raised. Um, uh, I just don't think that that there is sufficient time with this bill, which I think has got some extremely important um, uh, measures in it, to uh, to accomplish uh, right now. So um, uh, I also think that uh, the best move would be to uh, strike it from this bill, and then. Uh, the matter is, you know, you want to deal with it in another uh, another time. You know, we certainly would be there to um, to uh, express our uh, concerns and recommendations, suggestions, what have you. You could have a situation like in Massachusetts right now, where the um, groups are going to the Supreme Court uh, asking for emergency relief for certain individuals who are because of age or whatever. Um, uh, subject to <clears throat> heightened, uh, heightened, um, can't think of the word. Um, so that's currently happening, just so you know, by the way, uh, around the state, there have been many hearings. In fact, Judge Gerson assigned uh, Judge Pack so, uh, to hear uh, those hearings, which um, are happening. And uh, uh, he has been ruling um, uh, favorably for some of the incarcerated on this. Okay. This is David Chair. Just real quick on that point, I certainly understand it. Maybe it makes sense. It does make sense to move that piece to a different bill. Uh, certainly, no opposition to that. But I would uh, support um, having it in another bill so that it can still be considered. Our office does support that in some form, and, and we think it should continue to be discussed. Uh, we understand that it makes sense for that to be done in a different bill. That's totally fine. All right, so um, Bryn will just draft 217 with that one piece in it. 
Are there any other comments on the other pieces? Can I just weigh in on that piece? Is Matt Valerio saying to put it, Matt, are you saying to put it in another bill or get rid of it totally? I'm saying for now, just forget about it. Don't put it in another bill. I mean, I'd like to, if it had any chance of passing, I'd like to see it in another bill, but I'm not hearing that right now. And I'm not, uh, uh, you know, this is too important of an issue for it to be uh, the, for the rights that are currently being exercised with uh, um, petitions for extraordinary relief um, and, and the like to be limited by legislation that's considered on the quick um, and under odd circumstances like this. I, I'd rather just go with what we have than have you limit it, frankly. Okay. So anything else on any of the other sections of this bill? So that other than section six, which we'll take up a little later, are there any other issues with this bill that we could just um, be ready to vote on? Yeah, Matt? Yeah, just, just one. And I'm, I'm using two computer screens here too. So let me just get back to where I was. Um, it's uh, page two of six, line five. Um, and the only thing that uh, I, I would suggest here is that uh, after the words, um, I would want to have the defendant have the opportunity to consult with counsel before they make their on the waiver on the record waiver of uh, physical presence and that that consultation could be by by phone or or video or whatever but uh, um, so for purposes of this rule a defendant shall be deemed to be present in court um, at the time of the proceeding um, if after consultation with if, it have, if after having had the opportunity to consult with counsel, the defendant makes an on-the-record waiver. That's, yeah. that's the suggestion. Any concern about that from anybody? No. Okay. Not so, for me. Bryn, could you add that to the draft, please? Yep, yeah, will do. Anything else? Are we ready to take our first vote? Or should we see a redraft? tomorrow we could always yes and i i would like to hear for um about the mental health thing before i vote on it okay okay uh yep. did we clarify whether we need to ask the rules committee if we can vote uh remotely i, I think we already have that uh joe am i mm -hmm. correct on that we authorize the rules committee to allow it no the on a case by case basis yeah, my memory, Dick, is that we were granted permission to meet. I'm not recalling that we were granted permission okay. to vote a bill. Well, when I check on a Friday meeting with Peter, I'll check on that too. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Bill.